Okay, so let's go over the objective. The objective says what? Oops, let me scoot over. So you can read it from your paper. So uh, I scoot it over. Okay. All right, let's try it again. Okay, great. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to define the terms annotate and inference and the components that comprises them, okay? Because uh, in uh, high school, when we read, we don't just read for comprehension. We have to do a little bit of a deeper thinking, and that deeper thinking comes when we're annotating. And so we're going to learn what annotating is. We're going to take notes on it because you're going to annotate, and then you're going to turn in your reading with the annotations. And we also have to make inferences, okay? So we'll learn what those two concepts You ready? Okay. Morning number one. So we'll learn what those two concepts are. Then uh, we'll go over a class practice section where I'll teach you how to do both of them. And then you'll be set onto your... Um, uh, your actual independent practice. The first literature piece is uh, a slave narrative, which is a story written by a slave. Okay, so this year in ninth grade, we're studying the African Americans, and we're going to find out all the way from slavery how the Africans came to America, and then we're going to track their progress all throughout history and their literature along the way until we get to at least the Civil Rights Movement. I don't think we'll be able to get to today. I don't know if we'll have enough time to make it all the way to today and what African Americans are doing, but we'll at least get to the Civil Rights Movement, okay? So I'm gonna show you a video, and um, in the video, this is just our opening. So every lesson has some type of a hook, and it's called the anticipatory set, and it's really just to kind of hook you and reel you in to what we're about to learn. So before I deliver the information, when I deliver the information, that's the teach segment. Before I deliver the information, I want to capture your minds, precious. So I'm going to show you a video about slavery, then we'll get into uh, annotating. During this video, um, no one has their head down, everyone is paying attention, no one has their cell phones out, it shouldn't be on your desk, in your lap, it should be in your pocket. Okay? And um, there's no talking. There are video is uh, a lot of information. So just try to uh, stay on tune with what they're talking about, try to keep up, and if, if some of it is probably gonna go over your head a little bit. Slavery, the treatment of human beings as property, deprived of personal rights, has occurred in many forms throughout the world. But one institution stands out for both its global scale and its lasting legacy. The Atlantic slave trade, occurring from the late 15th to the mid-19th century and spanning three continents, forcibly brought more than 10 million Africans to the Americas. The impact it would leave affected not only these slaves and their descendants, but the economies and histories of large parts of the world. There had been centuries of contact between Europe and Africa via the Mediterranean. But the Atlantic slave trade began in the late 1400s with Portuguese colonies in West Africa and Spanish settlement of the Americas shortly after. The crops grown in the new colonies, sugarcane, tobacco, and cotton, were labor intensive, and there were not enough settlers or indentured servants to cultivate all the new land. American natives were enslaved, but many died from new diseases, while others effectively resisted. And so, to meet the massive demand for labor, the Europeans looked to Africa. African slavery had existed for centuries in various forms. Some slaves were indentured servants, with a limited term and the chance to buy one's freedom. Others were more like European serfs. In some societies, slaves could be part of a master's family, own land, and even rise to positions of power. But when white captains came offering manufactured goods, weapons, and rum for slaves, African kings and merchants had little reason to hesitate. They viewed the people they sold not as fellow Africans, but criminals, debtors, or prisoners of war from rival tribes. By selling them, 
Kings enriched their own realms and strengthened them against neighboring enemies. African kingdoms prospered from the slave trade, but meeting the Europeans' massive demand created intense competition. Slavery replaced other criminal sentences, and capturing slaves became a motivation for war rather than its result. To defend themselves from slave raids, neighboring kingdoms needed European firearms, which they also bought with slaves. The slave trade had become an arms race, altering societies and economies across the continent. As for the slaves themselves, they faced unimaginable brutality. After being marched to slave forts on the coast, shaved to prevent lice, and branded, they were loaded onto ships bound for the Americas. About 20% of them would never see land again. Most captains of the day were tight packers, cramming as many men as possible below deck. While the lack of sanitation caused many to die of disease and others were thrown overboard for being sick or as discipline, the captains ensured their profits by cutting off slaves' ears as proof of purchase. Some captives took matters into their own hands. Many inland Africans had never seen whites before and thought them to be cannibals, constantly taking people away and returning for more. Afraid of being eaten or just to avoid further suffering, they committed suicide or starved themselves, believing that in death their souls would return home. Those who survived were completely dehumanized, treated as mere cargo. Women and children were kept above deck and abused by the crew, while the men were made to perform dances in order to keep them exercised and curb rebellion. What happened to those Africans who reached the New World and how the legacy of slavery still affects their descendants today is fairly well known. But what is not often discussed is the effect that the Atlantic slave trade had on Africa's future. Not only did the continent lose tens of millions of its able-bodied population, but because most of the slaves taken were men, the long-term demographic effect was even greater. When the slave trade was finally outlawed in the Americas and Europe, the African kingdoms whose economies it had come to dominate collapsed, leaving them open to conquest and colonization. And the increased competition and influx of European weapons fueled warfare and instability that continues to this day. The Atlantic slave trade also contributed to the development of racist ideology. Most African slavery had no deeper reason than legal punishment or intertribal warfare. But the Europeans who preached a universal religion and who had long ago outlawed enslaving fellow Christians needed justification for a practice so obviously at odds with their ideals of equality. So they claimed that Africans were biologically inferior and destined to be slaves making great efforts to justify this theory. Thus, slavery in Europe and the Americas acquired a racial basis, making it impossible for slaves and their future descendants to attain equal status in society. In all of these ways, the Atlantic slave trade was an injustice on a massive scale, whose impact has continued long after its abolition. is um what's one thing that you picked up from the video one thing that Can you speak a little bit slower? Most slaves. Oh, you wrote it down? Look at you taking notes. Okay. All right, one more time. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if it was most slaves, but I would say definitely a decent amount of them uh, starved themselves um, or did other things to commit suicide. Um, yes, give me your name. Brenton. Brenton, right. Um, that in Africa, uh, slavery existed like, in different forms. Yeah, um, that's uh, very important. And everything. 
that the video talks about, we're actually going to talk about in great length. So um, I know it was a lot of information, but we're going to discuss it in length. Um, so yes, uh, slavery has existed since biblical times. So some people think that sla slavery started with uh, the white people forcing us to, uh, well, not us, but the Africans to come here, and that's not how it started. Okay? Slavery started with uh, really everywhere all over the world it was, and they made a deal for the Africans to come here. Yes. Okay, um, the people who were uh, pushed under the deck and packed under the deck as cargo, some of them never saw light again. Why do we think they never saw light again? Because they died. Okay, another one. I forgot them. Uh, about 10 million people, uh, Africans, were brought here. Another one? Africans made they some slaves. Oh. Right, so um, Africa, uh, the kings and queens in Africa, and they enslaved them uh, themselves. That's who the white people bought them from. The white people bought the slaves from <coughs> Africans. Um, one last person, Miss Wright. They got their ears cut off. They were captured. Okay, they got their ears cut off. There were uh, there were consequences for different things. Okay, all right. So thank you. Um, I asked other classes that, those same questions and they weren't able to really come up with the same thing. I'm glad you all were paying attention and picked up on those things. So now let's learn about our uh, concepts, annotating, and making inferences. So we're about to take notes. So let's go over the definition of uh, annotate. We just simply go to dictionary.com. And it is the following. Let's write this down on the same sheet of paper as our objective. Okay, thank you. Let's write this down in our notes. Just to supply with critical or explanatory notes, okay, or to comment upon in notes. What does it mean to supply? To give. To give, okay. Um, to supply or to give with critical. What's critical? Crucial. Uh, crucial. Important. Important, okay, uh, significant, or maybe it's a certain depth of thinking, okay? It's probably a certain depth of thinking or important uh, level of thinking, uh, crucial level of thinking, or explanatory. What's explanatory? To explain. to explain, okay? So we're supplying with a certain depth of thinking or importance or significance and explanation in notes. Okay, so when we break all these components down, this is basically what it's saying. To explain with a certain level of importance of thinking in notes. Okay, and we're giving this uh, on some type, of, uh, some type of commentary. Okay. Hi guys, I'm Katie Azevedo from SchoolHabits.com. Today's video is about how to annotate your text while you're reading. And if at any point during this video you like what you see, please give it a thumbs up. Or better yet, click subscribe below. I always forget on what side of the screen it is. So. Annotating a book or an article is a fundamental school habit that you'll want to develop as early as possible. Sometimes you might be required to annotate text and might actually get a homework grade for doing so, depending on your teacher. But even if annotating isn't a requirement, it's a great skill to have and just might be the key that you've been missing in your reading life. <laughs> True though. So first things first. Annotating means taking notes on a text, either in a book or an article or something similar. So to annotate means to take notes. Okay, let's write this down. To annotate simply means to take notes. Now you might be wondering why the heck you'd want to annotate anyway. For so many reasons. But the most important reason you'd be annotate is for a deeper understanding of the material. Awesome. So, okay, that's the purpose of annotating, for a deeper understanding of reading. Okay, a deeper understanding of, you're writing that down. Okay, for a deeper understanding of reading, that's the purpose of why we annotate, for a deeper understanding. So when we say, remember when I said critical, and uh, I said to supply with critical, and I said critical might mean that deeper level of important thinking, that's what that is to supply a deeper level of thinking. That's the purpose of what we do. So here are four major benefits of annotating. Number one, it keeps 
keeps you awake and engaged as you, as you read. You have to mm, you stay awake. And it reduces your chances of fake reading syndrome. I point that. You know, when you read and you think you're reading and you're not. Number two, it helps you process what you're reading as you're reading it. Number three, it slows down your reading, which is actually a good thing because decreasing your pace can often increase your comprehension and retention. And number four, it double whammies as a way to quickly find information later on. Okay. So let's write down the four reasons for um, annotating. One is it helps you to stay awake. Okay, let's face it, with the use of technology today, everything is so rapid and fast paced that to sit down and stop moving and to look at one sheet of paper that's not doing really anything significant it kind of bores us even to this day i still get a little sleepy when i'm reading certain texts and that's just because of our uh, repetitive use of technology and how engaging it is so to help you stay awake on the text annotate take notes that's how you get involved with it remember i said uh, at the beginning of this class in order to stay awake you have to participate next it says uh, it helps you to process what you're reading as you read it. So what you're recording, you're probably wondering, what are these notes? What you're recording is your thoughts. Whenever we're watching a movie, we always have these thoughts. Why did she trip right there? Did she know the killer is right behind her? She's so stupid. Okay, these type of same things you're going to interact with in a text. The same exact way. You're recording your thoughts. What did the author mean by this? I don't understand this phrase. Or oh, that's a good point right there. I've heard of this before. I heard of this back in the day when blah, 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 blah. All that stuff means you're engaging with the text. Okay, and it also slows down your reading, which is good. So a lot of times when the teacher asks us to read, we try to read as fast as possible. And once we're finished reading it, Jalen, we don't know what we just read. Because we read entirely too fast. No. Uh, next, um, it acts as a bookmark when you need to go back to the text. So if you're reading a long novel, odds are by the time you get to chapter 10, you've kind of forgotten a few minor details from chapter 1. So you want to have those explanations in your notes so you can remember those little nuances that you thought uh, were sticking out when you were reading. Okay? Words when you go back into the book to find something later, you can just read your annotations which is faster than reading the actual text a second yeah, time no. through. So, how do you annotate? Just as there are so many types of learners, there are so many different techniques that suit different students. You might have to experiment for a while to see what does and doesn't work for you, but there are some basic annotation principles or rules to keep in mind as you figure out your system. So here are 11 annotation techniques that you might find helpful. Number one, circle any unfamiliar words as you're reading, and then look them up and write down the definition. Here's a little hat. Okay. So the first thing that you want to do, so first of all, what she said is that uh, your mechanism for annotating is going to be different from probably mine, and it's going to be probably different from another student's. This is your way of taking notes. So a lot of times, if you own the book, you can write directly in the book just in the margins, in the sentence, uh, between the lines, wherever you want to, you're marking directly on it. But if it's not yours, then you have to use sticky notes or probably write on a separate sheet of paper. The first thing she said to do is to circle unknown words. We're writing this down. Okay, so this is step number one. Circle unknown words and look the words up. So just like we do before we read an actual text, I go through and I pick out the words that I feel are going to trip you up. Because we want to understand the text as much as possible because understanding is comprehension comprehension is reading okay if you get the dictionary.com app you can look the word up in like two seconds on your phone your phone right next to you not that you should have your phone when you're studying but number two use question marks in the book to indicate areas of certainty so uncertainty so Call anytime it. you're reading and you're like what put a question okay so just as she said anytime i'll, I'll come around Anytime that you're reading and a question is raised on what does the author mean or why did the character do this or maybe it's nonfiction and you're wondering why did this take place in history or whatever it is, use a question mark. Okay, so a lot of it is going to be different symbols that you use. So some, just like when you're in social studies and you're looking at a map and at the bottom corner of the map you see a key or you see a legend that helps you to understand what the different symbols mean. Jalen, put it away. That's the same thing with your annotating. You're going to have certain symbols that are unique unto you that you like to use going to, that are going to stick out to you. 
Okay, so uh, question marks would help illustrate levels of uh, areas of confusion in the text. Number three, use stars to indicate anything that seems important, such as themes or symbols oh. or foreshadowing. Okay, uh, the next symbol will be stars. Okay, some people use highlighters and they highlight certain things that are, are important because we see uh, a highlighted uh, marker a lot faster than we would see uh, underlining or, you know, just a pen or pencil in the book. But uh, you might want to put stars next to things that are important. Okay, next. Number four, use exclamation points to indicate something dramatic or a key turning point or something you want to come back to. Okay, next one. You can use an excla exclamation point to uh, identify certain turning points. Okay, so uh, maybe if you're reading a story and you want to know exactly where the, uh, the climax is of the story or where the um, exposition or introduction changes to the rising action or to the falling action, um, you can use those exclamation points. Next. Or use exclamation points to indicate something dramatic or a key turning point or something you want to come back to. Number five, circle or mark somehow, pick a shape, use a trapezoid. Remember oh, trapezoid? Uh, uh, yeah, there we go. All right, so um, you might want to mark off where you see or maybe just underline when you see characters' names for the first time. Okay, obviously this is when you're uh, reading fictional things. Uh, so you would uh, probably highlight or underline or circle where characters are being introduced for the first time. This way, if we're trying to make some type of a connection on what this character's involvement to the story really means, we can trace all the way back to when this character first came into the story. Okay, that's so unpausable. I'm remote of trapezoid looks like. Um, circle any character names anytime they are introduced for the first time in the book. Number six, keep a list somewhere, maybe on the inside cover, of all the characters and their traits. And you would add. Okay, um, keep a running list of all the characters, again, if this is fiction, um, that you get introduced to. Number seven, write your notes in the margins, which is the best method, on sticky notes, which is a decent method. Okay, so this is what I said before. Uh, these are places that you can actually take these notes. So you're literally writing what's in your mind. If you own the book, you're writing the book. Otherwise, if you don't own it, you can use sticky notes. Uh, some people write their notes in the book and they still use the sticky notes as tabulation for where that information is located. Okay, so you might say, you know, uh, Jessica appeared in chapter one, put a sticky note on the page where she appeared at. Okay, give a little uh, blurb about who Jessica is and um, her significance in the story. Uh, since we're only going to have a class set, you're going to do number three. You're going to take notes in your notebook on what we're reading. On sticky notes, which is a decent method, or in a separate notebook, which is the least favorable method. But if you don't own the book, you can't write in it, so you might have to do that. Number eight, paraphrase, which is oh, a summarization technique. Each uh, chapter... Okay, so... Um, you're going to want to paraphrase uh, each chapter because obviously, like I said, once you get to like chapter 5 or 10, there's bits and pieces that you've forgotten about the first and second chapter. Okay, and so instead of having to go back and reread that chapter or, or just not know what that chapter was about anymore, uh, you want to do a, a little paraphrasing and, and probably about a paragraph. Okay, so you know that chapter 1 was 15 to 20 pages. Sum it up in about two or three sentences. What was the main significance and importance in uh, the story without all the added details that they put in there? Um, also, when you have put question marks next to certain things of confusion, and then you go back and try to figure out what it's talking about. Let's try you have this now. Um, when you go back to try to figure out what it's talking about, you might want to paraphrase that. So you might say, this paragraph in the middle of chapter, of, uh, page three is extremely confusing to me. I don't know what the author is talking about here. And then you might take some, uh, some time and dissect it and you figure out 
Oh, this is what she's talking about. Okay, you might want to paraphrase that so you don't forget all over again. So it's important to leave yourself uh, little blurbs of what's going on along the way. All right, next. After you finish reading it. Now you only need a few sentences to do this. So write it down, write your little summary down at the beginning or the end of each chapter. Take the time to do this right after you read the chapter and not like five chapters later. Number nine, write down any questions that you have about the text. Either questions you're willing to wait to find out the answer to as you read oh. it further. Okay, so write down the question. So you might put a question mark, but still write out the question that you might have. Eleven. Okay, so uh, just because you put a question mark, it doesn't mean that you remember what the question was. You might have a specific question um, pertaining to it. So uh, put actual questions. Number 10, we're almost there. Use a color-coded system, if that type of thing appeals to you. Uh-huh, colors, yes, yes. Buzzer. Okay, so um, you might use highlighters, um, and your colors might mean something. Remember, it's really up to you. Number 11, give each chapter a title. So after you finish reading each chapter, go back to its title page and give it a title. Now, the title should simply be... Okay, last one is to give each chapter uh, a title. So um, authors will give chapters a title just to kind of point out some type of catchiness with it, but that might not give away any type of, uh, it might not allude to anything important that really happened in the chapter. So you might have to retitle the, uh, the title of the chapters. So once you're able to do all of these different things, then you'll realize that, hey, I can stay awake in English class because now I'm participating. I've come to the table with things to participate with, okay? And the rearmament of my notes is what keeps me participating in class. The rearmament of my notes. Keep in mind that your notes should represent your thoughts. Your notes should represent your interaction with the story, with the author, the characters, etc. And then this is the space bar. Um, write down the first one. Make sure.